No one believes more firmly than Comrade Napoleon that all animals are equal. He would be only too happy to let you make your decisions for yourselves. But sometimes you might make the wrong decisions, comrades. And then where should we be? So I finally got around to reading George Orwell's Animal Farm and this quote has stuck with me as I've been reading headline after headline, opinion piece after opinion piece and article after article about how terrible social media and in particular Twitter is and how it needs to be stopped. Quick side note, I can't help calling X Twitter just like I can't help calling Starburst Opal Fruits. My brain just won't adjust to the change. Anyway, this quote to me encapsulates the problem. We, the users, the consumers of social media, might sometimes make the wrong decisions on who to believe, might take in the wrong information, the wrong viewpoints, and then where should we be? Harmful content, rabbit holes, fake news, spreading hate, disinformation, misinformation, all these phrases and more seem to be popping up repeatedly, don't they? And usually, it is social media that takes the blame for it. Now don't get me wrong, social media has many, many bad points. Being always online or chasing likes, for example, can be bad for your mental health. And while mature adults might be wise enough to understand this, growing teenagers and young adults might not be to the detriment of their well-being. Social media can be a harsh place with far less focus on the established in-person social norms that we're used to and far more blunt, in-your-face, tactless, keyboard warrior type interactions. Cyberbullying is a very real reality for a great many people and not just children. The land of social media is still being explored and the rules of acceptable engagement are still being established. But let's be real here, we all know what is not acceptable. Threats, doxing and incitement to violence, for example, are obviously wrong and in most cases cases already illegal, as Antishak Simon Harris recently admitted. Should social media companies be doing more to combat that sort of unacceptable behaviour? Absolutely, and you won't hear me arguing against it. Nor will you hear me arguing against the safeguarding of children online. But what I will argue against is the expansion of that idea into more censorship and the curtailing of our freedom of expression. Because while safeguarding children and tackling threats and incitement of violence are are important, they should not be used as a stepping stone to ban and block opinions and expressions of those thoughts that might be considered wrong think. It has been said that the best and worst thing about social media is that it gives everyone a voice. That's a quote from an editorial published on the Irish Independence website. To me, that kind of thinking is quite revealing and more than a little bit short-sighted. Voting in a democratic country gives everyone a voice too. Should we now start suggesting that voting is is both the best and worst thing about democracy? Giving everyone a voice is, for me, the best thing about social media. Hell, it's given me a voice. I am merely an ordinary Irish wife and mammy with opinions and values, and here I am, expressing those opinions on YouTube. And to my eternal surprise, there are many who agree with me. With social media, you get to hear alternative opinions, hear and consider the other side of the argument that you might not otherwise hear. And crucially, you get to see people for who they truly truly are. I'm reminded of another quote, this time from the Millennial Handbook that is The Simpsons, where Lisa quotes, "'Tis better to remain silent and be thought a fool than open your mouth and remove all doubt." Social media allows us to see fools plainly and clearly. It allows us, with critical thinking, to discern for ourselves which side of an argument or debate sounds more plausible or more accurately aligns with our values. And it is this aspect of social media in my view that has our politicians and traditional media running scared and looking for ways to impose order on them. Roderick O'Gorman recently said that it was hard to refute conspiracy theorists who were sucked down a rabbit hole. This was in reaction to a recent Red Sea poll carried out on behalf of the Electoral Commission, which I'll link below, which found that about one in five Irish voters believe the establishment is replacing white Irish people with non-white migrants. He claimed that the statistic came from an online dialogue that had originated in the United States and that large chunks of the population get sucked into rabbit holes on social media. Now that doesn't tally with the poll's other findings on page 38 that show that 44% of voters have low trust in social media as a source of information and only 7% would have high trust. In fact, only 6-7% to of voters have high trust in 
main online sources of information such as videos, social media, online discussion forums and messaging apps. To me, that shows that people are well aware of the potential for misinformation online. So I really can't understand O'Gorman's argument that large chunks of the population are getting sucked into these online rabbit holes other than it being the easy answer. And yet it is arguments like this that are the basis for us to apparently need a civil servant to be hired to combat this sort of misinformation and for a national counter disinformation strategy working group and for our new watchdog Kamashun Naman. Misinformation is a go-to battle cry when our government is losing the room it seems, yet when the shoe is on the other foot they look the other way as we saw during the referendums when Catherine Martin doubled down on the fallacy that our constitution says a woman's place is in the home when it says no such thing. She wasn't the only one to tell lies and spread misinformation during those referendum campaigns and yet there were no repercussions or accountability for those politicians and members of traditional media who bent the truth and spread misinformation. In fact, it was much maligned Twitter that offered the only rebuttal to these lies in the form of community notes that showed up the misinformation for what it was. In my view, these rabbit holes of so-called misinformation that O'Gorman is referring to can be tackled by being open, transparent and honest from the start. Don't laugh, stranger things have happened. But also by not leaving voids of information in the first place. Voids like that will be filled one way or another. So maybe politicians and the media should stop sanitising and censoring the truth so that these voids of information become less common. But then that would take away the easy scapegoat of social media when a furious backlash is felt from the public, wouldn't it? We've also heard talk of the need to combat hate speech and incitement to hatred. This particular one annoys me, as while I have zero issue with tackling incitement to violence, this is different, and attempts to conflate the two are dangerous and disingenuous. Hate is a natural human emotion. We are free to hate what we hate. And you know what? Sometimes that can be irrational. As a lifelong arachnophobe, I know only too well what irrational hatred looks like, even though yes I know spiders are super useful and we need them, blah blah blah, I still hate them. I will never not hate them. But at least I'm safe in the knowledge that I will not be brought up on hate speech charges for having a pop at spiders and saying how horrible they are. But everyone on this planet hates something or someone, and often with very legitimate reasons for that hatred. We can all pretend we live in some wonderful utopia where hate doesn't exist, but that is a fiction. Hate is a real thing and it is necessary. We should hate and indeed are expected to hate the evils of the world so that we can be alive to the danger they bring. There is nothing inherently wrong with hate or expressing that hate. Society finds its own balance for what is acceptable to hate and what expressions of hatred might leave you ostracised without needing draconian laws to interject. If a debate is raging over whether it is acceptable to hate or dislike something, well how can that hate be legislated for? The answer is it can't, and to pretend otherwise is advocating for censorship. Then we have incitement to hatred. Now, I recently read a news article about how Minister Roderick O'Gorman is to contest the legal bids by survivors excluded from the mother and baby home redress scheme. That's right, instead of extending the scheme to everyone who is affected, Minister O'Gorman would rather fight those excluded in court. When I read this article, I felt a number of emotions, one of them being hatred. I hate that survivors were excluded through spurious reasoning in the first place. I hate that our government, who is on course to post yet another budget surplus in excess of a billion euro and who have just guaranteed funding of 725 million euro for a state broadcaster that can't manage its taxpayer funded finances, is so penny pinching when it comes to its own citizens that it won't extend the paltry scheme to all affected. I I hate that survivors have to go to court to attempt to find some modicum of justice, and I hate that Roderick O'Gorman will fight them in court. I hate that the mother and baby homes ever happened in the first place. Now I have no skin in the game here, I'm just an ordinary person with empathy reading this news article, and it has stirred me to hatred. So has the Irish Independent who published this story incited me to hatred? Has my retelling of the news article and my expression of my opinion on it? incited others 
response to hatred? And if so, why is that a bad thing? Again, while certain expressions of hatred will see you ostracized by civilized society, certain things are very much okay to hate. And if others hear the reasons why you hate something, well, they might be incited to that same hatred too. And conversely, arguing against a certain expression of hate may lead others away from that hate. Hate can cause offence, absolutely it can, but what exactly are we trying to control here? Because we cannot and should not legislate against causing offence through words, in my view. Freedom of expression does not work like that. What offends one person might be perfectly fine for others to hear. And so who gets to be the arbiter of offence? And does offence fall under harmful content? Just what constitutes harmful content? I would have thought threats and incitement to violence, but it keeps being mentioned separately, doesn't it? Much like how hate has no definition in our proposed hate speech bill, because Minister for Justice Helen McEntee doesn't think it's necessary, harmful content seems to be a catch-all. Freedom of expression is a fundamental human right enshrined in Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and nowhere does it specify that expressing hatred or causing offence is excluded from that article. But here we come to the nub of the issue, freedom of expression and those social media sites that allow a voice to everyone. Twitter, or X as it's now called, has been in the crosshairs of the EU for quite some time. Even when a threat to Antishak Simon Harris was made on Instagram, who took a long time to act on removing the threat in question by the way, somehow the focus of the many articles since has been on Elon Musk's version of Twitter. Why is that? It couldn't be because Twitter is less moderated than other social media platforms now could it? Again, do I think all social media platforms should do more to combat threats and incitement to violence? Yes, but that's not really what we're talking about here now, is it? We are talking about moderation of opinions. Opinions that might not be palatable to those in power under the guise of protecting us from misinformation and expressions of hate. And here is where another issue raises its head. In several of the many articles and opinion pieces published recently about how bad Twitter and Elon Musk are, many of their authors compared social media to traditional news media. The argument was made that a journalist has to be sure of what they're saying, otherwise their editor will not run the story and they could be open to legal challenges and so on. But this is a ridiculous comparison in my view. I use YouTube, I use Twitter. I am not a journalist. What I say in my videos are my own opinions. They are not the views of YouTube or Google. They do not endorse my views. They merely give me a platform to express them. Similarly with Twitter, what I post are my views and mine alone and are not endorsed by Twitter. A journalist, on the other hand, is representing their newspaper and by going to print, the newspaper has very much endorsed and signed off on what their journalist has written. YouTube and Twitter should not be responsible for what I say so long as it's not illegal, for example, incitement to violence. To say they should be is madness in my opinion. That would be like blaming the pub landlord for barstool gossip and misinformation and even hate and anger uttered on the premises. Social media sites are not news sites. The name social media is a misnomer. More accurately, they are social networking sites whereby people share opinions and have or start conversations. They are, in essence, a public forum, a digital, worldwide, highly accessible public forum. And when the EU have the nuclear option of shutting off access to sites if they don't adhere to the new Digital Services Act, you know we've crossed a line. The hypocrisy of that even being an option is not lost on those of us who have heard the EU criticising, for example, China for their online censorship. To me, this war on social media sites stems from a desire to control the narrative. It seems to me that politicians are not all too thrilled with the idea that thoughts, opinions and criticisms of government can be shared more freely and in a very accessible way amongst voters. This can be seen when they cry harassment when the vast majority of that harassment is actually valid anger and criticism. It used to be that governments only felt the wrath of the electorate at election time. Now, thanks to social media, we all have a voice and have greater access to those politicians who decry 
employ social media, even while using said social media, to their own ends. And so I come back to the quote that I started this video with. Our leaders would be only too happy to let us remain on social media, but if we stay on the current incarnation of social media, we might make the wrong decisions about what information to trust, what opinions to put stock into, and what arguments to listen to. And that wouldn't do, would it? Perhaps, and I'm just throwing out a suggestion here, but perhaps it would serve politicians better to worry less about these apparently troublesome algorithms that might lead us mere proles to those wrong decisions on what we believe to be the truth, and ask themselves what they themselves are doing that is causing so much anger and consternation among the people in the first place. So what do you think? Are you in favour of reigning in these social media companies? Do you think they are having a negative effect on the spread of information? Or do you also worry about the consequences of going down this rabbit hole of censorship? Let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe and hit that bell icon to be notified of new content. If you want to support the channel you can buy me a coffee or a super thanks which is greatly appreciated and a huge thank you to those of you that already have. You can also follow me on Twitter. Until next time, Slonga Full.